Welcome to the Key Contracting Issues in Digital Practice Design and Construction webinar, brought to you by AIA Contract Documents. This presentation is protected by U.S. and international copyright laws. This program is also registered for one AIALU. When you registered for this program, you entered your name and your AIA member ID, if applicable. We'll use this information to report your credit within two business weeks of the webinar. You'll also receive a PowerPoint recording of the webinar at the conclusion of the program. You should receive it by tomorrow. And we'll also answer questions at the end of the program, time permitting. So feel free to enter any questions into the chat or question feature on your right hand go to webinar window. And time permitting, we will answer any questions that we can. With that, I'm going to turn it over to one of our presenters, Michael Bamba. Mike, take it away. Thank you, Hosti. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, before we get into the program, Jim and I will just do a brief introduction of, of ourselves. Uh, as Hosti said, my name is Michael Bamba. I am director and counsel here at uh, the AIA for the AIA contract documents team. Um, I've been with the AIA for going on 13 years now. Um, and uh, I've worked on a number of different documents in our program and our drafting process. Uh, but most relevant to this program, I was involved on all of the development of our current uh, library of digital practice documents, including the E203, G201, and G202. They're going to be uh, the subject of uh, this program. And I work closely with our um, contract documents uh, volunteer committee, of which Jim was a member. And so I'll pass it off to him and let him uh, introduce his background. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um... Jim Bedrick. Um, I've been on the AIA Documents Committee now, I'm going into my 12th year, um, worked on the first round and the second round of uh, digital documents with, with Mike. Um, so we have a lot of history together and um, we'll be talking about some of the stuff we've done. Thanks, Jim. Uh, so for the, these are the uh, stated uh, published learning objectives. Uh, there are, our focus, though, really is going to be going through um, some of the uh, issues that uh, come up with uh, digital practice and with a particular focus on building information modeling. Um, we're going to take a look at uh, understanding certain roles and responsibilities and how um, the parties on a project can structure their agreements to govern those roles and responsibilities. Um, and we'll spend a, a fair amount of time focusing on how to uh, document and manage the process for communicating uh, what levels of development a building information model has been developed to uh, and the associated authorized uses when you are sharing a model uh, amongst various project participants on a project. And in doing so, we'll sort of do an overview of the AIA contract documents addressing those topics so you'll have a better understanding of hopefully the, the, the bigger picture issues and how the documents can be used to uh, address those. So uh, just a little bit of history. Um, uh, the set of documents we're going to be going over uh, in this program aren't the AIA's first uh, digital practice documents. We actually started to attempt to address digital data in BIM um, back in 2007. Uh, with an E201 exhibit document and then again in 2008 with an E202 which was focused primarily on building information modeling. Um, you know our, our normal drafting cycle for, prop, uh, for documents in our library is we review them on a 10-year basis um, but the digital practice is a little bit different. It's a lot there's a lot more um, uh, it's evolving a lot quicker so a 10-year process uh, didn't originally uh, work for that. So while well, we had a first shot in 07 followed up by a BIM specific document in 2008, uh, by the time 2010 rolled around, we decided, um, you know, we probably should take another look at these. When we when we did our 07 and 08 documents, those were sort of the the first iteration um, out there. There weren't there wasn't a lot to go by, um, and I don't know if there was a lot of 
uh, consensus on industry practice at that time. And, uh, and things began to evolve and change. And I don't think in 2010, there was a lot of standardization at that point, but uh, things warranted a, a fresh look. Uh, so we began soliciting comments, issued a number of drafts, including a, a draft for a public review and comment, which is not something we've typically done in the past. Um, uh, that was in 2012, which led to the 2013 documents that we're going to be going over now. So um, the, in 2013, we published the E203, the G201, and the G202. Uh, that set of three documents was intended to replace the E201 and the E202. Um, to understand what's in the three new documents, you have to understand a little bit about what was in the old documents. E201 mostly dealt with general digital data practice elements. Um, you know, are we going to have a um, electronic, you know, document management system? Uh, what 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 part of the project record is going to be in digital format? What format should it be in? And uh, if you receive it, how can that information be used? Uh, the E201 did mention building information modeling, but it didn't really go into the various unique details of uh, building information models and sharing models on the project. So the E201 was published in 2008, recognizing that BIM really required more uh, in 2000, and, uh, our E201 was 2007, recognizing that BIM required more in 2008, we came out with the E202, which is a building information modeling specific document. Both of those documents are exhibits to agreements. So the underlying agreement won't address those topics, but you would add the E201 and or E202 onto the agreement to address the, the relevant digital practice and, and BIM specific topics. Those two documents were all inclusive uh, on their subject. So E201 dealt with, and E202, uh, they dealt with uh, certain things on the project that would stay the same, sort of like, you know, what scope of modeling or what elements of the project are going to be modeled, um, you know, what, what format are we going to use, things like that. Uh, but they would also include things uh, that were more fluid. Um, if you're familiar with those documents, those are the big uh, tables uh, in the back half of them where uh, it would depend somewhat on uh, who the parties, who the other project participants were, uh, what role they were going to have, what your expected authorized uses were going to be for that. Uh, item. Uh, and what we found going from the 2007 to the 2008 documents was that uh, certain parts of the E201 and the E202 lent themselves to being part of an agreement as an exhibit. But there were certain parts that didn't. Um, one of the things about the E202 as an example from the billing information modeling documents is they said that, you know, you're going to have a, 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 a the model will be developed in a certain way. Uh, with certain reliance at each of these stages, um, and that you would develop those when you had, uh, but in the E202, you had to identify those all at the time you execute, executed the agreement. Well, the problem with that is, is that a lot of the players on a project, especially if you're in a design bid build or um, other um, non-collaborative type arrangement, you don't have all of the contractors and subcontractors on board yet. So it's it's a little bit hard to set those parameters out at the beginning about how the model will actually be developed from the beginning to the end of the project and how it's going to be used. So in 2013, we decided then, well, let's move those types of provisions um, for both digital general digital data and building information modeling that lend themselves to uh, being part of an agreement and won't be changed that frequently into an exhibit, a combined exhibit, which became the E203. For those items that needed to remain more fluid um, and that needed to adapt as the project uh, evolved and as more parties came on or left or something like that, we'll move those into uh, to form documents. So they won't actually be part of the party's agreement. So if you need to adapt the forms based on project circumstances, you can do so without actually having to amend all of the agreements on a project. So. Um, graphically, you can sort of see how we tried to achieve that between the E203 and G201 and the G202. Um, the G201 is now the form that covers general digital data. The G202 is the form that now will cover building information modeling specific. 
and the E203 is an exhibit that gets attached to the agreement. This sort of lays the baseline for both digital data and BIM on the project. <clears throat> so with that sort of broad understanding of the agreements and the forms, the new ones, uh, we're gonna go through uh, each of those documents in a little bit more detail um, to try to give you a better understanding of how they work and how they address certain topics uh, on, a, on a project when you're trying to figure out how you're going to use digital data in BIM. So Article 1, uh, as a lot of our agreements, is sort of a, uh, a general provisions uh, section. We have a statement of purpose. Um, probably the most important section in this article is Section 1.2, and we're going to cover it on a later slide, but it's the obligation to incorporate the exhibit, the E203, uh, into all the other project agreements. Uh, and uh, the major focus, I think, of the E203 is to set the ground rules or the party's expectations about how digital data and BIM are going to be used on the project um, so that everyone can kind of have an understanding of what to expect as the project proceeds. Now, it's possible that when you get into the protocols, um, the, the project may evolve to a point where the expectations now are, are, are more or perhaps less than what you originally thought. If that's the case, section 1.3 uh, allows for there to be uh, an, a compensation adjustment based on if there's sort of been a change from what you thought, what, what is outlined in the E203 from what gets done in the subsequent protocols. And then we have a section on um, uh, definitions. Uh, one of the things that we define are, are parties versus project participants. Um, because the E203 gets attached to a lot of different agreements on a project, uh, you'll see the generic use of the term parties and project participants. When you're reading the E203, just know that parties refers to the parties to the underlying agreement that that E203 is attached to. So if it's an owner-contractor agreement, parties means the owner and the contractor. And project participants would refer to everyone else on the project uh, that's not a party to that agreement. So in the owner-contractor agreement, the architect would be a project participant, the subcontractors would be project participants. If you're in the owner-architect agreement, the owner and the architect are the parties, everyone else, like the contractors and the subs and the engineers are gonna be project participants. So, as I mentioned, in Article 1, Section 1.2 is probably the most important section, um, and it's because it's one of the ways that uh, the E203 sets the overall BIM and digital data use guidelines for the entire project. And simply, all it does is, is require the parties to the agreement, again, that's the two parties that, have, that the exhibit is attached to, to incorporate the exhibit into all of its other um, uh, agreements with project participants that are going to be using digital data, which in our definitions includes BIM on the project. And the reason that that is important is because that's how these rules that are set in the E203 and also the subsequent uh, protocol forms that will come <clears throat> permeate the entire project. So you have an owner, you have an architect who is going to be modeling a project uh, and there is an expectation uh, that other participants on the project are going to be using that model and adding to that model and sharing that model. Um, and so the owner and the architect will incorporate an E203 into their agreement. Uh, and it'll have certain ground rules in there about how much of the project is going to be modeled, uh, what the authorized uses or an anticipated authorized uses are going to be for that model, and so on. So uh, you have that in the owner architect agreement. Now the owner and the architect are both obligated to include that E203 in all of their agreements. Uh, on the project. So the architect incorporates it into its agreements with the engineers. Well, now the engineers have signed up for the same ground rules. They now have the same scope expectations. Uh, they know how the model that they develop is going to be shared with the other side and how it's going to be used in general. The contractor now, because the owner has the same obligation of 1.2, gets it incorporated into the owner contractor agreement. So now the contractor has signed up for the same set of uh, expected authorized uses as the design side. So when they receive the model, they know what the model can be used for in generally. And then the subs will 
same thing with the subs. The contractor has to flow it down to its subcontractor agreement. So in that way, all of the parties have signed up for the same ground rules. And why it's important is because when you're developing the model, some of the concern is what is it going to get used for? Well, the way you solve for that problem is just to define what it's going to be used for on the other side. So uh, when you have all the, the contractor and the subs all signed up, <clears throat> uh, at least the ones that are going to be using the model, then you're good to go. Everyone has the same ground rules and same expectations. Uh, you'll see on this graphic, one of the subs isn't going to be modeling, so they don't have an E203 attached to their agreement. Now, if they did get the model and they were going to be using the model, but the contractor failed to, to flow down the ground rules that are set forth in the E203, you'd have a potential problem because now the sub is receiving a model, but it hasn't, re hasn't agreed to, nor is it receiving any kind of guidelines on how to use that model. Um, and that's where you get some of the risk to the owner and the architect because you have a sub who may be using it the model or relying on certain portions of the model that were not intended to be relied upon or not intended to be rel relied upon in, in the manner that they're being used. Um, to protect the owner and the architect, there is a provision in the E203 that makes them a third party beneficiary uh, <clears throat> to the contractor's obligation to flow it down because uh, in this arrangement, the contractor is the one who uh, messed up and didn't flow the obligation down. And so the owner and the architect, at least for that purpose, are treated as third party beneficiaries. Um, that's a whole other discussion, but uh, we don't have time for it in uh, this presentation. Uh, suffice it to know that that provision exists and that's the purpose for it. Focusing on Article 2, um, Article 2 addresses ownership of the digital data, but only in passing, and it relies on the underlying agreements. Um, all of the owner, all of the AIA's owner architect agreements will say, and the um, consultant agreements will say that the party developing the instruments of service maintains ownership of those instruments of service. Uh, so within that uh, realm, uh, that is how we do. Um, we don't need to address it in the E203. Um, the, if and if you're not using it within our own family of documents, if you're just using the E203 and um, on your own private agreements or or another set of documents that you're using, um, the only I would only advise that you need to make sure that the underlying contract addresses ownership. Um, and typically, you would say that the the party developing the the um, instruments of service would own the the copyright, but you need to make sure that that party grants sufficient license to the other par project participants to use the instruments of service that are bound up in that model uh, for the project. So um, that, uh, I'm gonna uh, pass it off to Jim now to take over for, for Article 3 and I'll come back in uh, later on and, uh, uh, and we'll pick up on some of these other documents. But uh, for now, I'm going to uh, make Jim the presenter, so. Jim, you should have control now and can uh, pick up yes. with uh, Article 3. There we go. So um, remember, uh, Mike was uh, saying earlier that uh, the 203 uh, is, is basically the stuff that you can set, set down at the beginning of the project, and then the others are uh, things that will evolve. So Article 3 of the 203 uh, addresses that, sets, sets down the, principle, the processes for establishing those protocols. So they meet and agree on protocols as soon as practical after the execution of the agreement. Um, don't necessarily have a schedule for that, but it has to be laid down pretty quickly. Um, what we'll do is identify the anticipated digital data. And if BIM will be used, we'll, um, there's an article in the 203 here that basically just sets down the basics of the BIM use and then points to the G202 for the details. Um, and these, the other digital processes, the other digital protocols are set down in the G201. Now they might be revised periodically based on the project needs as Mike noted, um, project participants will come in and out. It may well be that uh, as the um, 
project transfers transitions from design to construction uh, some of the responsibilities for uh, administration and storage of the uh, digital data may may transfer from the architect to the contractor. So it also contains the language here that obligates the parties to transmit, use, store, and archive in accordance with the protocols uh, in the most recent version of the G201. And again, the most recent version part is important because the G201 is designed to evolve, and so um, there may be a um, a second or third version of that uh, downstream in the project. So identifying the digital data, uh, there's a table in Article 3, and it lists the, first of all, it lists in the boilerplate the major, the most often used digital data, and then a, a lot of fill points, uh, an expandable table for fill points. Um, the the main thing to note here is that if you look at things like um, submittals and modifications and notices and claims, that sort of thing, the um, prime agreements now the, between the architect and the owner and the owner and the contractor and so on um, now define written uh, written notice as um, anything that goes through the agreed upon um, digital data system. So now, if you're if you're using a uh, project EDMS, electronic data management system, if you note here that notices and claims are, are to go through that, then posting a notice or a claim to that system um, qualifies as giving the notice in writing. So this is really an important point to note and, and important to get down what it is that you're. Uh, d depending on the EDMS for. So the, the list then is here, and then fill points for more. This column here is uh, notes whether it's applicable to the project or not. And then there's a place for more detail. Um, you can either put the detail down here. Uh, there are fill points for um, detailed description, or you can attach um, a, uh, an exhibit that goes into more detail on the on the system. Article four is the one then that deals with BIM. And remember, this just in two hundred three, this just deals with the very basic um, things of BIM. Are we going to use BIM or not? And the first piece, the Article one of um, pardon me, Section four point one of Article four. Um, sets down a really basic difference in how you're going to use it. The, the first checkbox here says the parties will use it only for f fulfilling the obligations set forth in the agreement. Okay, that so that means basically to produce your drawings usually. Um, and it won't be relied on by anyone else in the project. Okay, and it says, unless otherwise agreed in writing, any use of the documents, any use of the model is at the receiving party's sole risk. And then you don't need to worry about the rest of Article 4. This is basically the approach of the, um, the disclaimer that many architects put on their model that says, basically, this is for reference only. This, um, checking this box, Puts the puts the uh, model use in that uh, in that role. The um, second box, though, if you check this one, shall develop, share, and use, and rely upon the model in accordance with 4.2 through 4.10. All right, and so this sets down the that we yes we are going to share the model, we are going to let others rely on it, but we'll go through the details of how they can do that. Um, in sections four through ten, and then that will, of course, also point to the G202, which will go into more detail. Now, that first one, the dis that uh, the first section, it really um, is pretty much the same thing as this disclaimer. And then what this disclaimer boils down to is something like this. The model looks great, so you can use, look at it, but you can't use it for anything 
or rely on it for anything, which includes, but it's not limited to everything. And usually these things have some sort of a, uh, an obligation to, to defend. So basically, if you use it, then you're going to have to pay my lawyers whatever they want. So the what that boils down to, though, that disclaimer really says if that some of this information in the model is not reliable, so don't rely on any of it. So really, the, the real heartburn that architects have in sharing the model, other than uh, intellectual property issues and some of those, the real problem is that the model can contain information that the the author of the model didn't intend. Uh, things look precise in a model when they may be just placeholders placed approximately. Um, the, they might be, you might have um, library objects that you put in the model, like a, a specific door, but you just put it in there for a placeholder. It has a lot of information on it that you didn't intend. So that's the, the real problem is all that information that you don't intend and didn't intend and probably don't even know about that's in that model so you don't want anybody relying on that but this disclaimer approach really says that since there's some of that information that's not reliable don't rely on any of it so that the problem there is that that really um, reduces the the use of the usefulness of of building information modeling as a communication and collaboration tool so the AIA developed this, what we call a specified use approach. And we agreed, yes, some of the information is not reliable. So only rely on what I say you can, for the purposes I say you can, and to the degree of precision that I say you can. All right, so what that does then is, is I have to actually tell you that you can rely on something in my model. And so if there's information in that model that I don't know about, obviously I'm not going to mention it. And since I don't mention it, you can't rely on it. So that's what protects the architect or the author of any model of having somebody rely on information that they didn't intend. One of the things that the is laid down again at the beginning of the project is the anticipated uses. So the, uh, First of all, there's the scope, which portions of the of the project are going to mo be modeled, and then the uh, the anticipated uses. Now, this is uh, things like um, estimating, scheduling, uh, coordination, that sort of thing. So, the, if we, for example, if the uh, model, if we don't put down uh, coordination here. And then later on, we try to uh, use the model for coordination. What's going to happen is that the model may not have been developed with that in mind and might not be uh, reliable for coordination. So that's the, the uses that you're going to put the model to um, have to be stated here so everybody knows. And then there are ancillary modeling that, such as, oh, things for marketing the project, renderings, animation, that sort of thing. So to move on with Article 4, uh, then we're going to establish this process for, for setting BIM protocols. And this, again, just as with the uh, general digital data, we have to agree on these protocols as soon as practical after the execution of the agreements. These protocols are then set forth in the G202. And that is that may well be revised periodically based on the project need. So that's why it's a, again it's in a G form, a separate document from the exhibit. It also obligates the parties to use and rely on the model in in accordance with the most recent version of the G202. Okay. So it yet it also specifically looks at the right to use or rely on the model before and after the establishment of the protocols. So before, if, if a party receives a model and that these protocols haven't been established, it's pretty much that disclaimer uh, scenario. The, the, any reliance is at the receiving party's sole risk, okay, and there's no liability to the other contractors. So if you haven't specified the protocols, then you do have no liability in sharing the model with others. 
after you've set the protocols, then the party must use the use the models in accordance with the protocols. And if again, if they go outside that, they use a model inconsistent with the authorized uses, then um, it's their sole risk. Okay, so that protects the author of the model. Now, the Article 4 also sign, it does some housekeeping issues, assigns responsibility for model management, which is usually assigned to a project participant, often the architect at the beginning of the project. And it identifies the um, protocols to be established, um, storage location, naming conventions, that sort of thing. And it, it identifies ongoing responsibilities for the project participant who is assigned to um, to the model, to, to manage the model. Um, there they also may be post-construction models. I think many of us are running into issues where the um, owner now wants a model for various facility management purposes. The problem is most of them are, a lot of, a lot of owners are saying, well, I want, I want BIM, I want some BIM. They have no idea what they're what they're going to use it for, and so it's pretty hard for the architect to then give the the owner a model that will suit their purposes. So this is a place right at the beginning of the project where we will list what kind of of uh, post construction uses the models will be put to, and now we know to develop throughout the project to develop these um, the models in accordance with. Um, the uh, post-construction model purposes that we've listed here. So, Mike. Thank you. Yeah, and um, just to add on to what Jim was saying about the post-construction model uses, uh, going back to the differences between the E203 and the G form, um, it's the and the reason this is in the E203 is because this discussion about what's the expectation post construction should happen as part of as part of negotiating your original agreement. So that, because you know it's not as simple as at the end of a project just turning the model as it exists over to the owner for these purposes. Typically, the the model will either need to be developed in a particular way, or when the project is done, the certain information may need to be added or taken out of the model. Uh, to make it useful for the intended purpose. And all of that impacts scope, and there may be some time and expense that goes into that. So those discussions need to happen up front, not at the end of the project when the owner decides, hey, I might want to do some of this stuff. You know, and if, if you didn't include it in the original E203, whether it was the architect or contractor or whomever that's going to have to do it now, you can have that conversation with the owner and say, listen, we didn't we didn't agree to that up front. We can do it now, but it's obviously going to cost a little extra. So um, that's why it's in the E203 as a, as a discussion point. So now that's we're going to move good, into the. Oh, sorry, Jim. Point, Mike. I mean, the, the uh, we saw back a little while back there that um, it does allow for uh, uh, additional services. The the agreement the agreement does so. This gives you backup if you're all of a sudden required to do more than you were you were expect than you expected to do. Uh, you've got some basis to ask for additional services fees. You know, I think Jim actually said that you know owners in the in, without a firm understanding of what BIM actually is and what what its various capabilities are, you do see a lot of owners out there saying you know I, I want BIM on this project or. Or architects or, or a contractor will suggest the use of building information modeling. And as owners get educated as as the project goes along, they become aware. They can often become aware of its capabilities um, and begin to want more, to ask for more. Um, and and that's why those topics have to be addressed in the E203 from the get go, so that you have some. You, you can't just say, I'm going to do BIM as the architect and the contractor. You need to put some parameters around it. And so that's what the focus of the E203 is. Now, the, the G forms is, are different. It, they're not part of the exhibit. They're not part of the agreement. They are sort of the, where the rubber meets the road, road on what are the protocols for actually using digital data and actually using um, billing information modeling on the project. So 
as I said earlier, it's the G201 that's going to address your general digital data protocol. Um, this is not going to be a BIM focused document. And so because it's focused on uh, general digital data, um, if you are familiar with the E201, um, you'll find that the table that was in that document forms the heart of the table that's in, in the E201. Um, but it does some other things too. And, and the, the major focus, and we won't go into too much detail on this document, um, uh, mostly because BIM seems to be uh, of uh, the, the most interest to everyone. Um, the focus of this is it, of this document is going to be establishing the system requirements and use protocols. If there is any kind of electronic document management system, you'll identify software requirements, hardware requirements, um, what the storage processes are going to be, archiving um, obligations. Uh, and who's going to be responsible for overseeing that. So that they have a certain amount of protocols they have to keep up with uh, in terms of archiving uh, and giving access to, to the system. Because all of those things are important um, in making sure you have a, a useful electronic document management system uh, project-wide. Um, and then for the general digital data items, the, the large table that, I'm, that re the slide references from E201, the approach of that is it, it lists a, a bunch of different types of information that can be um, used on the project in digital form, um, such as um, communications, the contract doc, uh, certain contract documents, submittals, uh, things like that. Uh, and it'll allow you to identify whether uh, what format those things will take in digital form, and if you're a party receiving one of those that that data, uh, what your authorized use is going to be. Typically, it'll be sort of, you know, like read and reproduce, not not edit or something like that. But uh, um, it it allows for the parties to define uh, how that type of general digital data is going to be used. Sorry, I was muted. So remember, we talked earlier about one of the protocols that we have to set down is to limit the reliance on the model um, to what I say. What I say, you can rely on it uh, for what purposes and to what degree of precision. So how do we say that? Well, the um, in the initial development of the E202. We came up with this uh, based, actually it was based on some work first by uh, Graphisoft and then by uh, AIA California that um, identified that while systems tend to move through the process from concept to final design at different rates, usually the uh, structure will lead everything else and things like the casework will lag farther behind. What we find is that the most systems hit certain milestones, certain common milestones. They hit them at different times, but the but the milestones are fairly identifiable. So we gave these milestones um, labels. The this idea of level of development. Okay, 100 is is conceptual. 200 is generic placeholders. 300 is specific assemblies, and then um, 400 is shop drawing level uh, detail models. Um, you will find sometimes that uh, you'll get a request that for a, a quote LOD 400 model. Um, it's not going to happen. If someone is asking for that, they uh, they really they're they're not understanding what that means. It means that you're going to do shop drawings of the paint. So um, that's a case where the architect or contractor whoever is developing this model needs to educate the owner and work with the owner to find out exactly what they do need. These um, LODs then are further explained um, after they came out we found that the um, these definitions that the AIA had they, they were great definitions but they were open to interpretation so the um, BIM forum got together uh, put together an interdisciplinary committee to basically um, 
assign basically d d develop um, examples of some 400 building systems and components, examples of them at the different LODs. So now this this uh, basically provides a dictionary. So now if someone asks you for an LOD 200 door, if you've both signed up uh, for uh, to this spec, which has become um, the very it's become very widely accepted. If you both signed up for this spec, now you can point to this document and find look up a door and find out what it uh, uh, looks like at LOD 200. Now these definitions that are in the um, uh, the digital practice docs contain more um, further information. There is the narrative description um, the, the, for example, the 200, it's graphically represented as a generic system. This is your generic placeholder level, but it also goes on to specify how you can use these elements. So uh, for analysis, things like um, uh, performance simulation and so on, um, cost estimating, uh, a good example, and the model element here could be used to, el used to develop cost estimates based on approximate data provided. Okay, so if you've got LOD 200 doors in the model, then that means you, they're only good for an approximate um, cost. The um, 202 then contains uh, at the end this uh, model element table where um, these the building systems in your model can then be defined given an LOD for each milestone. And you can see the milestones are generic, so those you can fill out uh, yourself. Um, sometimes it's the standard SD, DD, and CD. It might be um, many owners have standard cost checks that they have during design, so there might be a, a deliverable in there for that. There might be deliverables at the end for specific facilities management uses. So the, um, as well as the, um, the two documents, or the, pardon me, the three documents, there is also a guide that is published. Um, at the time, there was more, probably the guide contains more in it than, than savvy um, BIM users need, but it does give a full, full in-depth expl explanation of these documents and section by section how to fill them out includes examples and model language. And then it will be, or is being periodically updated um, as things evolve. All right, Jim, thanks for jumping in there. Uh, I. Uh... It sounds like I got disconnected or something, but uh, we're going to move on now with the C106 is a, the last of our digital practice documents to address. Um, it is a whole separate uh, agreement. It's uh, really unrelated to the E203 and the G201 and the um, G202. The, the purpose of this is it's a simple licensing agreement, um, and it's intended for uh, transferring uh, a license for digital data uh, for, for for two parties that don't otherwise have some sort of a relationship. So, uh, you know, in the owner architect um, agreement, there is in our standard agreement, there's a, a, a license granted between the architect and the owner. Uh, so the owner has the right to use the architect's instruments of service, including those in, in digital form. Uh, so there's no need for a separate grant in a, in a licensing agreement. Um, but if the architect were going to transfer um, or a contractor we're going to transport for uh, its model or other digital data to somebody uh, that they didn't otherwise have a licensing arrangement through their agreement, they can use the C106. Um, there was a previous version, the 2007, I think, um, and we updated it in 2013, um, and it was just minor edits. Uh, one of the major ones was to actually add a fill point at the end where you could list the digital data that was subject to the license. Uh, and important uh, subject to 
to discuss in any agreement. But uh, the document itself is pretty simple. Um, you know, the 2.1 is, is the grant of uh, a non-exclusive limited license of the digital data that's identified below. Um, and it sets the parameters for the license um, that, it, that it be used uh, solely and exclusively to perform services or construction for the project. Um, and, uh, and then it goes on to, to, to discuss to, to discuss ownership, you know, it's just a licensing agreement, so there's not going to be any kind of transfer of ownership. So um, there's the general grant of a license subject to the, the terms and conditions of this C-106 agreement. There's language that maintains ownership uh, in the party who, who creates and transmits that um, uh, uh, digital data. And then in Article 3, there's sort of an open area where you can put all of the limitations on the license. Um, so far, the only thing the agreement has done is to say that you have a license to use the digital data in accordance with this agreement. You still need to put the parameters around it. And that's where Article 3 is going to come in. Um, you know, if you are transferring a, uh, a model to somebody that uh, hasn't, uh, isn't in the contractual chain and it wouldn't be subject to the E203 or something like that. You could probably reference a G202 here and use the G202 and the LOD definitions to define how that model can be used. If you're just if you're not dealing with the model and you're dealing with some other digital data, you can probably just write um, uh, what limitations they have here and, and what the reliance levels are and things like that. Um, but it's uh, this is where the document ends up being very flexible. And in being so, there's not a lot of language here. You're just going to have to write the limitations that, that you need to uh, to write into it. So um, that is actually the last of our prepared slides. I will um, note that we have a lot of information on our website. Uh, so we do encourage you to go there. If you have um, additional questions, you can contact our AIA document content uh, helpline. Uh, we can't give legal advice, but we can uh, talk through um, what the standard language uh, in our documents is all about and uh, what their in intended meaning was. Um, you can either email us at docinfo at aiacontracts.org or give us a call. Uh, if you are an ACD uh, online user, um, we, we uh, have a, a tech support line, so please feel free to uh, contact us there. Um, with that, I will pass it back. I'll leave this uh, contact information up on our screen, um, and I will pass it back to Hasi. Uh, and if we have any questions, uh, we will deal with them in the uh, closing minutes here. Thank you very much, Mike and Jim, for that thorough presentation. Again, we do apologize. We had a little bit of a technical difficulty, um, so thank you for your patience. Um, I do now welcome you to enter any questions into the chat or question feature, and we can get to them now. As a reminder, you will receive the PowerPoint recording and follow-up materials, hopefully by tomorrow, uh, so look forward to that. And with that, um, I'll give a minute for you to enter questions. Now, Mike and Jim, we do have uh, one question here. We have successfully required use of BIM by the GC for their responsibility for coordination drawings for MEP trades. How would this fit into the E and G series documents? Well, I could take that, Hosty. The um, what that that um, where that fits is in that table that we saw at the at the uh, end of the G202. And that's where you define a model that you define the model elements that will be useful for the, then for the coordination. Does that answer the question, Hosti, or was there more? Um, I believe that was the entirety of the question. And again, we'll give a minute for any additional questions to come in. Uh, can the E203 document be used in conjunction with the custom BEP? Uh, absolutely. Uh, BIM execution plan, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, uh, in fact, that's I think the, the way probably. Would be, you, 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 go ahead, Jim. Okay, I'll take it. Um, so I was just going to, yeah, you go ahead. The, uh, 
it um, that's probably the way it's usually used. Most most uh, people that are going to use a uh, use BIM to a, to a large extent on a project will have a, a good BIM execution plan. Um, often that may include uh, use of the model element table that's included with the um, uh, BIM form LOD spec, which is basically the same layout as you see here and uses the same um, definitions. I should mention that the um, the in the development of the um, the BIM form LOD spec, uh, AI licensed the BIM forum to use the word for word definitions out of the um, the uh, G202. So those those uh, uh, LOD definitions are the that are in the contracts are enhanced by that uh, that publication and so. You can see in that what what levels of um, of things you need for the uh, for various purposes, and those kind of those things are usually included or often included in a BIM execution plan. So it, the BIM execution plan then supplements uh, what we have here. With the ever evolving technology, what are the next level of development for these documents? Uh, we're taking a look at them now um, and uh, no promises on a deadline for when there will be an, an update coming, but we are beginning the process of uh, taking a look at these documents to see what uh, changes, if necessary, uh, need to be made. Um, so uh, stay tuned. We will, in the not too distant future, probably have some updates there, uh, but at least for the next year to two, these documents will be the, um, the most current. But we are actively uh, looking at them and have formed a task group in our documents committee uh, to determine what, if any, updates are, are necessary. Many of these are necessarily defensive, but what contract route should an architect take if they want to work more closely with subcontractors or fabricators through a model? Want me to take that, Mike? Yeah, sure. You can give it a start, and then I'll add in at the end if I have to. Sounds, sounds good. Okay. So, um, yeah, that, that's a great question, and because we we don't want to get so defensive that we can't um, use them. Remember, in the two check boxes uh, in the um, 203 about how you're going to use modeling, the first one is this basic uh, disclaimer that says you can look at it; it's pretty, but but you can't um, rely on it for anything. The second checkbox says, well, we're going to lay out the reliance uh, in the subsequent sections of the document. So then uh, if you look at the table, the model element table and defining various systems at various LODs, you now have, uh, you, you're able to transmit a model to another project participant and that, that person, that, that firm will know exactly what they can rely on the model for and what they can't. So that that G202 and the model element table and the supplementary BIM form LOD spec really enable that communication and coordination and collaboration um, using models. Yeah, I would add that those documents, the, the G forms are intended to be flexible. When, when we, anytime we draft standard form agreements, it's always a fine line between providing some set standards as as guidance to start from uh, versus just leaving it completely open and letting everyone choose their own adventure. Um, you know, so the, the documents themselves have a few, um, I talked a lot about in authorized uses. So for each level of development, depending on what number it is, there's an associated amount of use that, that, that is relied upon it. And if you're going to be, if the expectation is that, that the model is gonna be used for fabrication, you would add fabrication as one of the authorized uses. And then for each number in the LOD scheme, uh, as, the, as the model gets more developed, you would advance the level of reliance associated with that, with the fabrication authorized use. So I think that the documents could be used to, um, to, to, use to, to do the kind of work that you're talking about with subcontractors and fabricators. 
uh, you just have to tailor them to what your expectations are so that when the fabricators receive the model, they know how much it's been developed. We are advised by our lawyers to have contractors rely on stamped and sealed drawings for construction. The BIM information provided is for convenience only with many disclaimers. Is this what most architects are doing? Mike, I think that's I, probably... I can start, Jim. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The lawyer talk, got it. Um, yeah. Exactly. Let's see. I don't know that uh, we have studied on what most architects are doing. Um, a lot of architects, I will say, are still relying on those disclaimers. That's that's kind of why we had that somewhat farcical uh, disclaimer in, in this presentation to highlight the fact that a lot of a lot of architects are using models in their practice, but when it gets to sharing. They're, they're attaching those very limited disclaimers. And as an attorney, I understand why those things exist. Um, but from the architect's perspective and the contractor's perspective and really the owner's perspectives out there, that's not taking full advantage of the power that building information modeling offers. Um, and so I think there is a growing number of people that want to move away purely from disclaimers. Now, the sign, uh, stamped and sealed, you know, that's getting into your 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 code requirements and, and your licensing requir requirements for you know getting a permit for construction and and um, you know and whether or not uh, a model is a contract document, which again is a whole other probably presentation. Um, I would say that it's hard to say that what what most architects are doing, I would say that you're you're hitting on an area of flux right now, um, and it's going to take a little time for the industry to come up with what standard practice. Uh, we're in a, I think, in a period of transition on how exactly modeling is going to transform the industry. We're we're still trying to figure it out a little bit. Yeah, I'd agree with all of that, um, Mike. Um, anecdotally. Um, what I'm seeing is that most architects, yes, still use the disclaimer and rely on the pay stamped and sealed paper documents, but it, it, there are quite a few architects now that are allowing reliance on the model and um, are actually trans sharing, transmitting the model to other project participants and allowing them to rely on it. So that I, I'd agree with Mike, that is a growing uh, movement, I think, within the industry. And I think that the demand in the industry is going to require a um, movement away from reliance on the pure disclaimers. Now, the attorney in me kind of likes those disclaimers because they're easier. Um, no reliance is a lot easier to deal with than some reliance and, and some conditional reliance. But I think that from the construction industry standpoint, um, there's going to need to be a forced evolution away from that. Um, uh, but I, I can't get away with not, not agreeing with those attorneys to a certain extent. I hate to admit it. Uh, I, talked, I think that was the last question. That is the last question. I would like to uh, plug a webinar that Jim will be presenting for AIA contract documents on March 19th, Managing the Risks of Model Sharing. If you're interested in attending this free webinar, please visit our Learn page. You can see the link um, on your screen. And if you filter our training by live training, you can register and receive the call-in information for that webinar. Um, again, I want to thank Jim and Mike for taking the time to prepare and present today's presentation. Thank you all for your interest. You will be, be receiving the PowerPoint and recording uh, by tomorrow, as well as you will be uh, receiving one learning unit, if applicable, for your attendance in today's webinar. So with that, I want to thank you all and wish you a great afternoon.